Craig Wilson is the um, Delta Water Master, who in statute, I believe, is uh, required or recommended or encouraged to report to us on a quarterly basis or regularly? What, what's, the, what's the frequency? The, the statute, Water Code Section uh, 85 uh, 230, says that the Delta Water Master shall submit regular reports regular to the reports. Stewardship Council. Okay. Well, we appreciate you coming to provide a regular report <laughs> in irregular times. Thank you. Thank you. And for the record, my name is Craig Wilson. I am the state's Delta Water Master. Uh, I am not a, a geotech guy from Holland. Anyway, I'm pleased to be here today to provide you with a updout update of Delta Water Master I issues. And the uh, you know some of the topics that that I'll be talking about today are, are listed in, in this uh, slide. Uh, I will at the end of this presentation talk a little bit more about curtailments. I know that's a, an issue that's very uh, uh, visible in the state water development you know at this time. So I will spend some time and have a few few slides dealing with that subject. But before I get to that. Yeah, I will be talking uh, about the topics, uh, water use in the Delta, kind of our continuing strategy to provide more certainty about who's using water in the Delta, how much, uh, where the water is being used. Talk a little bit about Term 91, which is a, a form of curtailment. It's really not a drought curtailment. It's been fairly routinely uh, exercised, but talk a little bit about its implementation. Talk a little bit about compliance issues, mainly related to uh, the uh, the major water projects, water rights uh, that are set forth in decision state water board decision D 1641. Uh, there's various terms and conditions in that permit to protect beneficial uses in the delta, and I want to talk about a couple of compliance issues associated with that. Talk a little bit about some of the formal reports that I have filed uh, you know, during my my tenure, and kind of give a, a flavor for how some of those reports have been involved in some of the current issues during this drought year. And then, like I said, lastly, I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the curtailment issue. So anyway, the, the first topic, these, these next few slides will, will summarize uh, my office's continuing effort to provide more certainty regarding water use in, in the Delta. Uh, you know, the big takeaway from, from this slide is to show that, you know, the, uh, the number of statements filed, 2,510 out of the total, is very high. Those statements reflect the fact that most water use and most diversions in the Delta are pursuant to senior water rights, either riparian or pre-1914, and that will become very important when we start talking about, about curtailments. This next slide is basically a summary of, of, of kind of the, the vehicle we use for generating information regarding Delta water use. It's the various reporting requirements, uh, either the statements of water use and diversion filed by, by riparians and pre-1914 water rights or regular reports of uh, state water board permittees or licensees. Uh, for the 2012 reporting, you can see that we, we spent a lot of effort and a lot of time getting compliance and, and we're very successful in doing so. The 2013 reporting year, uh, the report is not due till July 1st of this year. And in fact, since this slide was uh, presented, the, the, the stats have gone up quite a bit. So we expect to have you know, virtually full compliance uh, again. The next topic I want to talk a little bit about is something that's on the State Water Board's website. If you go to the uh, the main page and click on the Delta Water Master icon, you can get to this interactive water rights map of, of the Delta. And what it is is kind of a readable, easily easy to use summary of uh, data regarding water use uh, in the Delta. It has a map of the entire Delta with all the diversion points. You can scroll onto each individual tract or island, uh, get a screenshot, which I'll show you, and then we also also have narrative uh, summary of all the water use on the various uh, tracks. So here's an example just of one, one track. Uh, there's actually four different screens you can choose from, but this is kind of a, a topo view. Uh, the blue dots represent uh, riparian and pre-1914 uh, diversions that we have information on pursuant to these statements of water diversion and use. And you can click on each of these dots and you'll get taken to the actual statement so you can get very detailed information on each diversion. Uh, the red dots reflect permittees or licensees of the board, and which there are much fewer of. You only have one or two on this particular slide. 
And here's an example of another view. You just have different views uh, of these various islands and tracks. <coughs> And then lastly, you know, we do have a summary uh, of almost all of the islands and tracts up. So this is just a very uh, a short one because it only involved a, a very simple diversion situation. But some of these summaries do go on for several pages detailing the various water uses. So again, it's kind of a, you know, our, our way of, of using these, these reporting vehicles in, in an interactive way to, to provide more certainty in, in a kind of an easy to use, easy to read format. Okay, changing topics, uh, Term 91 uh, is actually the, the first of the curtailments that was issued uh, this year, and, and it's more of a traditional uh, curtailment. It's more routine. Uh, while there have not until this drought year been curtailments issued you know, since 1976-77, Term 91 has actually been invoked quite, quite frequently, and it is invoked when, when the major projects, the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, are, are releasing uh, water uh, from their storage reservoirs that has been previously stored into the system to meet water quality standards in the Delta. And when that occurs, uh, the the water rights that are junior in priority to the uh, uh, projects are given curtailment notices. And in fact, this year a curtailment notice went out on, on May 13th and was effective uh, on, on May 20th. So that's it on Term 91, but I will talk in great detail about the more general drought curtailments that, that are happening a, as we speak. On compliance issues, uh, you know, reporting requirements, as you saw from my previous slide, virtually everybody has complied with the re reporting requirement in the Delta, so there's very little enforcement activity taking place, but we have uh, you know, gone you know, through the Attorney General's office to try to get the few remaining people to comply with their reporting requirement. But what I really want to talk about is a couple of issues relating to the, to the project's water rights and their compliance efforts to meet various conditions in the, the state's uh, Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. And, and the first one I want to talk about is what I call the, the San, San Joaquin River Vernalis Pulse Flow. And uh, Decision 1641 and the underlying Water Quality Control Plan do have a requirement that a certain flow uh, go down the San Joaquin River in the spring to to do have serve multiple purposes to uh, support fish movement down downstream to help uh, salinity standards in, in the South Delta and also allow you know some additional exports during the early part of the season and. Uh, as you know, the State Water Board has issued a temporary urgency change order that has made some modifications to some of these standards. And, and uh, what happened with this one is that there was a, a modification made to the pulse requirement, but it still had a very robust flow, about 80 percent of what was normally required. And I, I was, you know, involved quite, you know, um, uh, quite a bit in, in working with the projects and making sure that they came up with a proposal that while it didn't totally meet the, the standards of D6041, it still had a, a robust flow and that, and that did happen. The next issue is dealing with salinity in the South Delta, which has kind of been an, an, an interesting issue. The, the uh, State Water Board adopted a, a, a plan for salinity protection, ha had a, a, a standard and, and it was uh, to be measured at four compliance points. And uh, three of those four compliance points, we have pretty good success, but there's one particular compliance point. I guess it's, it's, it's at this point and in, in along the old river where there's just kind of a lot of meandering channels coming, kind of coming together, very little uh, circulation where that, that standard is fairly routinely violated. And I've been working with the Department of Water Resources and with the South Delta Water Agency on, on potential fixes. And, and, and we did have a meeting uh, just a couple weeks ago that was a pretty good meeting regarding some things that could possibly be done to try to, uh, you know, avoid this, this continual kind of chronic violation problem and try to ho help some of the salinity issues in the South Delta. So this leads me to the uh, next topic, a kind well, of a... Just this on, on that point, sure. does, does that mean uh, moving the monitoring station, uh, changing the standard, or uh, actually increasing the uh, water flow? Uh, no, good question. I, I think the department would, would very much like to change the, uh, the compliance point, but I, I doubt that that will happen. I mean, I think it's good to have a compliance point in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where you do have maybe the worst issues, so it tells you what the situation. So, some, and we're not, uh, 
the board is looking at a potential modification of, of the standard itself. Uh, in the summertime, it's a, a 0 0.7. I, I can't remember the, the acronym that goes behind that, that. And they're changing. In the summertime, it's a 0 0.7 standard. And they're thinking of changing that to a year-round 1.0 standard. But that a slight relaxation with some findings that that will not adversely affect the, the agricultural uses to have that slightly saltier standard. But what we're talking about is more actual fixes, things like possibly uh, dredging the old river just, just upstream of that compliance point to get more circulation, or potentially uh, getting some of the drainage water. There are a couple of uh, large uh, agricultural drains that come into the old river just upstream of this compliance point, and possibly rerouting some of that drainage into a, one of the channels that has more circulation and, and getting, getting into a situation where there's better dilution. So we're actually looking at at, at physical fixes to try to meet uh, a standard that, that might be slightly relaxed from what it is now, but not, not dramatically. So anyway, on to the, uh, to the formal reports that the Delta Water Master provides to the council and to the state water board. When, when, I, when I interviewed for the job of being Delta Water Master, you know, I had a, a lengthy discussion with board members about what this provision you know, meant, this submitting these regular reports, and we both we all kind of concluded that this was kind of the sleeper provision in the Delta Water Master Authority. It was, in, you know, gave the Water Master the ability to, to to look at some policy issues and provide some some uh, direction and, and and information to the board and to the council on various issues. And, and these are, are some of the reports, not all of them, that were were filed. Uh, as, as Randy well knows, I kind of stumbled out of the block a little bit on on the first report because I, I kind of you know, developed a, a report on agricultural water efficiency and, and the state's constitutional docu doctrine of, of reasonable use. And, and, and I thought I was making a fairly you know, benign statement that, you know, you know, we need to look at efficiency everywhere, but because agriculture uses so much water, you look at a lot of the very good things and the very sound efficiency practices exercised by most farmers, but see if some of that efficiency could, could be applied in, in other places and, and save some water. Well, you know, a lot of people you know, looked at the report and said that it, the conclusion was that you know, Wilson said farmers are wasting water. And you know, I, I don't think I said that. And I think subsequent to the, uh, to the report being issued, there, there were statements made by the National Academy of Sciences and by, by I think, your council and your plan. And, and uh, the BDCP policy documents all recognize that you know that that ag um, because of the amount of water being used that there there is a role for you know efficiency and, and, and increasing some of the the you know widely used efficiency practices that the farmers are already using and it was interesting a couple months ago there was a poll taken by uh, you know uh, on. Of, of all Californians of our, regarding various water use issues. And, and the one issue that got a, a very high majority of, of people saying yes was that, you know, could, could there, you know, should water efficiency in the Aggie area be one of the things that be considered in the mix of everything else? So I, I think the report, while it was, it was controversy and maybe a, controversial, maybe I was the first person to, to say something like that, is, is really kind of kind of heighten things but again for Randy for Randy's benefit I want to emphasize that I think most farmers are using water very efficiently and the idea was to try to you know you know migrate some of those efficiency practices to the few that may may uh, may not meet that standard the the, the Craig, other part, part Craig, of that, we couldn't we couldn't dismiss uh, <laughs> the the report because you did have uh, credibility your credentials were you had moved aluminum pipe as, as an employment uh, practice when you were in college. So you had some irrigation experience. Well, you, you, you just weren't utilizing the most efficient means of irrigation. You have a great, great memory, Randy. Uh, Randy's alluding to the fact that my, my first paying job that I ever had was, was moving around uh, siphon uh, pipes, uh, you know, for 12 hours a day all summer to, at minimum wage, but we won't get into that. Uh, the, the other part of that initial report that, that's kind of interesting is, is that I, I presented quite a bit of information about the constitutional doctrine of, of waste and unreasonable use. And, and in fact, uh, and one of the conclusions I was making is that 
that that doctrine had been used kind of reactively in court cases and, and maybe could be used more more proactively to to guide you know more general uh, decisions and in fact uh, the state water board did take a make a decision a, a couple of weeks ago on on some tributaries uh, up on the upper sacramento river that established some some minimum flows and had some some either curtailments or voluntary agreements to to ensure that those minimum flows were met and the the underpinning behind that whole action was the the, uh, the reasonable use doctrine. So you, you are seeing an example of, of maybe a, a better use of that doctrine. One of the other reports I, I filed was on the, the water rights uh, enforcement authority and uh, you know, concluding that, that there could be some strengthening of that authority. And in fact, in March, the legislature did act to make some changes to the water code to, to, code to enhance water right enforcement authority. It's, it's related. Uh, and it's limited to, to drought situations, but it did have some enhancements, and, and this report was was at least used as, as a, a vehicle to inform the legislature and some of the things that could be done. Uh, like I said, Term 91, I've already mentioned that. The only thing I'd really add to, to what I said before is that in the report that I presented to the council a couple of years ago, I suggested that, that, that a Term 91 type principle could be established or used more broadly to, to the post-1965, you know, uh, water right holders, the people that were junior uh, to the projects. And in fact, you know, this report has been used by, by the State Water Board and its staff to look at some of the options on how curtailments uh, could be handled. And then the last one I'll talk about is just the, the, the area of origin law report I presented. And I won't say anything more about the fact that, you know, I did reviewed some of the recent cases that tried to distill some of the principles. And I think uh, it has been cited in some of the debates on how the, the priority system should be working uh, this year. And I'll be getting into a little bit more about the priority system when I talk about, about curtailments. So, um, <clears throat> great. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the following observations can be made regarding the area of origins law. Their intent seems clear, colon. So th th this is clear to you or this should be clear to everybody. To provide some measure of protection for area of origin water, such that water will be available for future needs, notwithstanding the development of export projects. That's clear. It, it, it's it's clear to me. I and, and my this is my report, and you know I, I I'm not you know trying to put words in anybody else's mouth. But what I did, as you might recall, is I went through that there have been four or five court cases, appellate and court cases in the last decade. Uh, which discussed the area of origin laws, and I, I tried to go through those cases and, and distill what I thought were some some prin principles that derived uh, from that. There might be people that, that disagree with that, but that's that's my my take on, on at least that that first bullet uh, from what what the court cases were talking about. I, I guess I was, and I should listen to your report. Um, it's what some measure. Is isn't that part of our difficulty? In, I, I think you know. In, yeah, in I, I see about how this subject. Yes, yeah, some major. I think the reason I, I, I kind of you know couched it in more generality terms is that you know the, the the cases themselves you know tend tend to talk very generally about the subject because the the laws themselves. If you read the area of origin laws, they they don't go on for page after page after page. They're fairly succinct in, in, in what they say, and they, they do paint with kind of a, a broad brush. And, and uh, you know, I just started, I think I started out to say some measure, and then these, some of these other uh, bullets that followed here kind of spell out in a little more detail what, what I meant by that. But uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to, to maybe take a look at the full report, and if you have any questions, feel free to, to contact me. So that leads me to the last topic that I want to discuss today, and that is drought curtailments. I, I would say, as a caveat, that you know the, the the state water board and its staff is 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 dealing with this subject right now. I have not been you know, directly involved in that staff effort, but I do have familiarity with the subject matter. So, 
this first uh, slide is just kind of stating you know the obvious when when you, when you don't have enough water in the system uh, the way the way the water right system works is it, it, you go to this priority system when when you're, when you're talking about post 1914 rights the rights that are actually governed by permits and licenses issued by the state water board is is a first in time first in right type of concept where where the priority system uh, you know means something and that's the uh, uh, justification for having curtailments is where you can conclude quite obviously in this year there's not enough water in the system to satisfy all waters water users needs and when you get to that make that conclusion then it's the junior water right uh, appropriators when you're talking about post 1914 that would be subject to uh, the curtailments so this next slide it kind of kind of shows the the build up to where where we get where we've gotten to just this last week the, the legislature in, in March passed emergency drought legislation, and they did authorize the Water Board to adopt uh, emergency regulations to deal with uh, curtailments uh, based on the priority system, provided that the governor had issued a drought proclamation. That drought proclamation uh, was issued. And a second proclamation was issued basically stating that, that the Water Board you know, should use this authority as necessary to uh, curtail water use. And so the, the, after that uh, proclamation, I think that the staff began to put together some alternatives of how that would work. Uh, eventually, the, the State Water Board decided to, hey, not so fast, let's not try to move forward with a staff recommendation. Let's hold a workshop, hear from, from the interested public on, on, on what to do. And, and the staff presented four, four different options on how curtailments um, might occur. Uh, the board held a, a two-day workshop May 20th and 21st. Uh, and no action was taken at that workshop. I suspect, you know, in, in the near future, I would, I, my my belief is that the board will have an agenda item dealing with the use of the emergency regulation authority. I'm not sure exactly how they will handle curtailments, but there will be some some adoption of emergency regulation. But in in the meantime, you know the the there was a you know, a, a need to act because you know the water simply wasn't available. So uh, what happened is. The, uh, the executive director of the state water board has just this just this week issued drought curtailment orders. On Tuesday, he issued an order to the entire Sacramento River watershed. On Wednesday, he issued a curtailment water is order to the uh, to the Russian River watershed, and and yesterday issued a curtailment notice to uh, diverters on the San Joaquin River watershed. Now, I want to make sure that people understand this is only to the post 1914 water right people. Uh, and the people that are, you know, junior in priority to riparians and certainly the pre-1914 appropriative diverters. But we did have a curtailment one order. The Sacramento River one went out to something like 2,600 people. But the notice was sent also to more senior people, putting them on notice that in the future, uh, you know, and, and it's very likely later this summer, um, that curtailments could extend to pre-1914 and riparian water right holders. Uh, Mr. Wilson, the B this morning had a terrific uh, article on the curtailment notice, and I, I told you before the meeting, I was intrigued with the two comments. Uh, Tim O'Laughlin, who represents the Oakdale Irrigation District, announced to the B, there's no way senior water rights holders are going to share the pain. We'll just say no, and then we'll just go to court and see who's right about this. Then it's just going to be a water rights war. And then uh, Dan Kelly, representing the Placer County Water Authority, carried on in that vein, saying the reality is water right priorities are harsh. There's no health and safety exception to the water rights system. There just isn't. Even, even giving full credit to the um, uh, tactical nature of my profession to always uh, 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 declare dra dra draconian uh, uh, action pending. It seems to me that it's likely there'll be litigation on the authority should it t when it begins to touch senior water right holders. And there's a lot of stuff going on now that's just, you know, you look at it and it's just, it's n almost like a novel the exchange contactor, Friant litigation, 
the fact that the Placer County Water Authority, while defending their water rights, is marketing 35,000 acre feet of water to Westland's Water District at the same time. Do you have any simple explanation of how these, this thing all works in some total to make a rational set of decisions in the public interest? I'm not sure I could give you a, a, a simple explanation. I could give you, you give you some, some thoughts. I mean, the curtailments that were issued this week is kind of the, the, the lower hanging fruit. I mean, you, you, you clearly got a situation where you look at the supply, uh, you look at the water available, there's not enough to go around. The priority system says first in time, first in right. Uh, I, you know, I think that same article you, uh, you, you quoted from the B, I, uh, you, you read from the B, I had a quote from uh, uh, David Guy from you know, NACWA saying that the board was absolutely justified in, in issuing the curtailment notices to the post 14. So, so that's, that's the lower one, hanging fruit. One would proof. assume he might have a different view of the subject if it were extended to pre-14. Right. Yeah. And, and I think some, some of the you know, way you might be able to view this is that you know, come this summer, I think most of the water <laughs> that's going to be in the major water courses of California is going to be uh, project water. It's going to be store water that was previously stored and is being released downstream, either for contractual purposes or for uh, water quality standards in the Delta. And no water right holder, no matter how senior they are, has a right to divert this previously stored water that's moving downstream to, to meet either contractual needs or beneficial uses. So if you key off on that, uh, you, I, I think you readily get to a situation where there is not going to be enough water in the system to satisfy even the more senior water right holders. Where it becomes very complicated is that the riparian water right holders, the, uh, in the Delta, the vast number, and statewide a considerable number, uh, they don't have this concept of, of, of first you know, first in time, first in right, riparian water right holders uh, shared the water in times of shortage. So it's going to be really tricky on how you, how you try to curtail, you know, the riparian uh, user because they will always say, well, hey, there's, there's a little bit of natural water in the system and we ought to be able to share in it. But it probably will be very, very little, you know, because you have this water system that's you know, usually commingled with natural flow, abandoned flow, and stored water releases. But this summer, most of the water is going to be this, this stored water, cause so there's going to be very little, if any, water for the riparian. So I, I think the board would be on, on, on sound legal ground to, to issue curtailment notices to to pre-1914 uh, and riparian people, but how they do it is, is kind of the, the rub. A, a lot of people are objecting to some of the options that the, the staff came up to, you know, like, like you alluded to this health and safety exception. Right. The board considered as part of a curtailment, should, should certain people be accepted from this, no matter you know what their priority might be, if, if it's their, like their sole drinking water use. And a lot of the people that appeared before the workshop, you know, were just pounding their fists on the table, saying, "Wait a minute, that's that's a gross violation of, of these you know long-standing uh, principles of of uh, priority of use." And, and then they cited certain court cases, including a you know, case by Justice, Justice Roby, uh, I think it was the El Dorado case, where, where the, he concluded, yeah, you, could, you, you can't mess around with the priority system by including Term 91 and, and uh, some people's permits, but not in people that are junior to you. But in that same case, you know, uh, Justice Roby said, you could have some exceptions to the priority system based on public interest principles. And I think that's what the board's grappling with, with this, this health and safety thing. I don't think you're looking at a lot of water. So, uh, you know, the, the people are saying, hey, that the principle of, pr of priority is going to be violated. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not going to be in a major sense. Uh, but on the other hand, you could potentially deal with a few cases of, of uh, health and safety through just exercising enforcement discretion, you know, to not, not uh, take action, you know, and, and get some determination that way. So the board's grappling with all of these. It's, uh, they, they've done the easier ones now, I think, with the pre-14s, I mean, excuse me, the post-14s. It'll be a lot, lot more difficult. Re refresh my memory. Back in the 1970s, uh, did, uh, did the curtailment orders then touch the pre-14 users? 
Yes, there, 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 there were, you know, a very general prescription what was, was sent out to, to people to, to uh, you know, cease discharge or minimize discharge in the case of riparians. Uh, I, I don't recall how much of an enforcement effort, uh, you know, Did how you much of a compliance. Do you recall whether litigation was filed at that time? Challenging that activity. Yeah, I think there was some litigation filed, but just events passed it by. You know, as soon as the you know the, the drought ended in seventy you know eight, you know the, you know how slowly the, the machines of the judicial process worked, it just kind of mooted out the you know the whole idea. So there were never any reported cases that decided some of these principles. Randy, I have a question. Sorry. 